January 1st, 2000. The date has an unreal sound somehow. The beginning of a new millennium, the dawn of the second age of the common era. From ancient times, it seems, we've been expecting something unusual to accompany this milestone. The Mayan Indians predicted the end of the world would coincide with the second millennium. The pyramid at Cheops is reputed to be able to predict the end of mankind. It stops at 2000. Science fiction writers of the 1940s envisioned a brave new world when they let their imaginations cross the century mark. More modern science fiction writers frequently picture a post-apocalyptic Mad Max kind of world. But 2000 is on the threshold. Neither a world of flying cars and regular space travel, nor a post-apocalyptic nightmare world. Instead, 1999 will end much as 1998 did, and celebrants at New Year's parties around the world will toast in the new year with plenty of champagne and soon-to-be-forgotten resolutions. It will also give life to an electronic destroyer, the Millennium Bug. Imagine waking up that New Year's morning. The room is dark and cold. The heating system you've taken for granted your entire life is not working. The electricity that hums silently in the walls of your home is, for the first time, not there. You pick up the phone to call your utility company, and the phone is dead. You stumble to the bathroom to splash water on your face. The faucet sputters. A few drops of water spray out, but then nothing. You groan as you realize that the millennial dawn brought not a brave new world of the future, but a quantum leap into the past, a world without electronics. All the skills you've accumulated over the course of a lifetime are of little use. Anyone can fry a steak, but how many can butcher the cow? Take a look around your home. How many steaks could you fry if you had no electricity or gas? What will you wash it down with? Take another look around. If your water faucet's dried up right now, what would you do? No heat, no water, no electricity. Could this be the dawn of the 21st century? Is this our immediate future? We'll see what the experts are saying as we continue our countdown to millennial midnight. Hello, I'm Hal Lindsey. And I'm Cliff Ford, and welcome to this special IIB report, Facing Millennial Midnight. This time last year, it seemed we were the only ones talking about the Y2K problem. Today, you can't make it through a day without hearing something about it. And even if it's wrong, most of what is passing for information is either just plain wrong, or it's wildly optimistic hype. In order to prepare for every possibility, you have to understand what the possibilities are. Now, to do that, you need to know what Y2K is. The Millennium Bug is the product of incomprehensible short-sightedness on the part of the first computer developers, who evidently forgot that the 20th century was going to come to an end someday. When the majority of today's computer systems were first created, the original designers were forced to decide how to define dates in computer data. Stored in databases and files, this data was dependent on a date value in order to function. This date value was to be defined by assigning a number to the day, month, and year that it represented. Sounds simple enough, doesn't it? Well, when the time came to assign numbers to these dates, the programmers decided to define the year field using two-digit rather than a four-digit representation. Here's an example of what the programmers did. Using the day, month, year format and two-digit year representation, January the 1st, 1975 would be expressed as 010175. That's the day, month, year format still in use today. The 19 in the date was assumed. That assumption may well go down in history as the most monumental blunder of all time. Any date into and beyond the year 2000 will have a different logic to it than any date in the 1900s. As a result, any computer that uses this logic will be unable to compare the two. 
This will result in any number of errors, ranging from miscalculations to computer stoppages and malfunctions. For example, consider the two-digit field 40. It could be the year a building was constructed, 1840, a birth date, 1940, or an insurance policy expiration date like 2040. All the computer sees is 40. A building built in 1840 and insured for 100 years starting in 1940 would mature in 2040, except the computer would interpret all three events as happening at the same time. When we first began hearing about the year 2000 problem, it was in the context of, don't worry, everything is under control. That seemed unlikely, given the fact that at the time, nobody was doing anything about it. It seemed the whole planet was content to sit on a digital time bomb and hope that somebody would develop a silver bullet that would defuse it on time. Now, the more we investigated, the less likely the silver bullet scenario seemed to be. Our research into Y2K led to the writing of our first joint book project, Facing Millennial Midnight, released this month. Now, after researching the probability of such a silver bullet, we explained our findings in the book under the heading, The Only Silver Bullets Belong to the Lone Ranger. The problem with the silver bullet theory is this. To work, it would have to recognize and repair faulty codes in thousands of different proprietary mainframe designs. No two are identical in the mainframe world. All operate on different platforms, and most are written in different languages. Almost all use different source codes, and most are custom programmed. Now, to fix them, you'd need, at the minimum, the original programmer's documentation. Even then, it may not make any sense to a new generation of programmers unless they understand the original programmer's shorthand system. Ideally, finding the original programmer would be the best solution, that is, if he isn't retired or dead. Many who are betting their future on the silver bullet are looking to Bill Gates and Microsoft to set the odds. How many times have you heard somebody say something like, I'll let Bill Gates worry about it, or Microsoft will figure out something, or some other such nonsense? Well, it ain't gonna happen, folks. With all the technical expertise at their disposal, working on software systems that they themselves develop, knowing that Y2K threatens their very existence, Microsoft was only able to bring its own software into compliance after a fashion. All of Microsoft's new operating systems, like Windows 98, are Y2K compliant now. It says so uh, right on the box. It only makes sense then, if Microsoft can make its software compliant, the same principle should be adaptable to fix other software platforms, right? It would seem so on the surface. But the truth is, Microsoft is only partially year 2000 compliant. And 2001 is going to be a real problem. For example, while 96% of Microsoft's software was either Y2K compliant or compliant with the minor issues, the BIOS chips in some PCs meant that Microsoft's Y2K solution would only work for a year and would break down again in 2001. The BIOS chip provides the interface between a PC's central processing chip, such as the Pentium 2 chip, and the PC's real-time clock, which contains a quartz chip. While PC real-time clocks are Y2K compliant nowadays, most BIOS chips are not and will strip the year field of a date back to two characters, 00, instead of 2000, before handling it, handing it on to the operating system. Now, Microsoft had fixed this problem in its operating systems, but for BIOS chips that reset each time the computer was switched off, the fix would only last a year, since the fix only applied to the year 00 and not 01. In other words, Microsoft, the Y2K giant slayer, has failed. Although they have developed a software fix, it doesn't really work. Instead, it's a workaround patch. Microsoft, with all its billions of dollars, programming resources, and its own self-interest driving the whole project can't come up with a workable fix. So what does that say about the silver bullet option as a whole? Well, the answer is obvious. The only silver bullet still belong to the Lone Ranger. As of late last year, the North American Electrical Council reported that they just didn't know if the lights would stay on past 010100. 
But early in January, they changed their tune. NERC released a report to the Department of Energy that is now being interpreted as proof that no power problems will occur, period. This conclusion is based on nothing more than the suggestion that electrical utilities are making progress on their compliance efforts. Not a single electrical utility to date has made concrete claim of full Y2K compliance. Most nuclear power plants are still in the assessment stage. The assessment is only the first 1% to 7% of the job, depending on the situation. That means that they have at least 93% of the job remaining and less than 300 days to finish it. A report from the Nuclear Energy Watchdog is even less encouraging, according to the Nuclear Energy Institute. A majority of America's 103 nuclear power plants still have not finished the assessment stage to determine which of their computer systems will be affected by the year 2000 problem. Well, there are several stages necessary to beat the year 2000 bug to death before the deadline. Now, stage one is the assessment stage. This is the stage when you find out if you even have a problem and how big it really is. The next stage is remediation, which is the stage when you repair any problems located in stage one. The next step, the most critical step, of course, is testing. Now, that is necessary to ensure the fixes you've developed actually work. Since Y2K is a date problem, adequate live testing should take a full year's cycle to be certain it works. Anyone who wasn't at stage three by January 1, 1999 is, by definition, already too late to make the deadline. The final stage, implementation, is when you put your new and improved Y2K proof system online. Now, that stage should come at the completion of a full year's testing, and hopefully before January 1, 2000. Are you starting to get the picture? Most of America's electrical utility providers are still at the assessment stage, stage one. Somehow, stages two through four need to be crammed in the remaining few months in order to keep the lights on past December 31st. And every fix has to be perfect to avoid problems. Anyone who's ever bought a first release version of a commercial software package knows better than to believe that now. But Americans seem more than ready to believe that utility companies will do a better job of debugging software than professional software development companies do. How the electric power grid is not the only utility that is threatened by Y2K. And it's not even the most important one. You can survive without electricity a lot easier than you can survive without drinking water. And America's drinking water supply is by no stretch of the imagination guaranteed beyond December 31st. For example, according to Senator Bob Bennett, a water purification plant in Utah set its clocks ahead to January 1st, 2000. The plant managers wanted to find out what would happen to their non-Y2K compliant computer systems. With the computers ill-equipped to handle the new date, the plant malfunctioned dumping poisonous quantities of chlorine and other chemicals into the water. Bennett says the story is true. He recounted the story during an address in January to the Colorado River Users Association in Las Vegas, but refused to name the Utah, uh, Utah water treatment plant in question. Water is the basic necessity of life, and most of us only know how to get drinking water by turning on a faucet. Y2K could dry that water faucet up overnight. Not only could a Y2K glitch cause the wrong mix of chemicals, it could lead to water shortages. Y2K caused power failures could disrupt sewage treatment plants, causing sewage to back up into basements or spill into our waterways, some of which are used for drinking water. As we wrote in our new book, Facing Millennial Midnight, you can live for weeks without food but only days without water. There's only one thing more critical than water, and that's air. Water is the cheapest commodity on Earth, unless you don't have any. Then how much is it worth? The testing process itself is filled with dangers. A recent Y2K test at the nuclear facility in Peach Bottom, Pennsylvania, didn't work out as planned. The test was expected to be a breeze. The unit in question had been completely debugged by the programmers. It had been analyzed for a week in a simulator. 
It was even being hooked up to the backup system of the facility's central operations monitoring system. But when the computer's clock was turned ahead to January 1, 2000, something went wrong at the Peach Bottom nuclear power plant. The facility's primary and backup operations monitoring systems provide control room technicians with vital data. Things like temperature, pressure, and water levels in the reactor's core. Those systems crashed. Every computer screen in the plant's control room blacked out and froze. Plant managers began planning to shut down the facility. Peach Bottom supplies electricity to the Philadelphia area, and after seven hours, they located the problem. It was a human error. A technician reset the wrong clock, resetting instead a non-compliant system. Jared Vermeil is with the Nuclear Regulatory Administration's Reactor Systems Branch. He explained to the Washington Post, with computer software, it's hard to anticipate all the difficulties you can run into. And too often, he says, it's what you haven't thought of that comes back to bite you. Hmm. Well, the failures that did occur showed what will happen to any non-compliant system connected to the power grid after millennial midnight. It also reveals more clearly the hidden dangers involved in the upgrading process itself. Upgrading systems to recognize the new millennium introduces the risk of repair-generated bugs creating new problems. Now, computers now being tested in live conditions are showing undiscovered new bugs. Newly repaired machines are making unanticipated errors caused not by Y2K, but by inadvertent bugs written into the software code. We've already had a couple of foretastes of what Y2K is capable of, even though most people weren't aware of the year 2000 connection. In April 1998, a software problem caused a cascade failure with AT&T's system. Before it could be contained, 44 hubs were knocked out of service. This cut off phone service to vast numbers of both business and residential telephone customers. Certain business functions were immediately crippled. Email services, banking transfers, manufacture orders, ATM machines, and credit card services were compromised. AT&T explained that a software-generated problem, which began in two of their mainframe relay switches, replicated itself into some 145 nodes across the frame relay network. Phone service in the affected areas was out for up to 24 hours. Since AT&T handles about 40% of American network customers, this was a major problem that cost American business multiple billions of dollars. Although the blackout was limited to AT&T networks, to those people directly affected, it might as well have knocked out the entire globe. And it only lasted a day. What effect would it have had if the problem had lasted days, weeks, or perish the thought, months? Hmm, hard to even think about. 50,000 customers in St. Louis were billed incorrectly for the month of January. Now, each customer was billed for exactly the same amount of water consumption by the city's water utility. Now, the billing error was caused by a programmer who forgot to remove test data from the system. Just over 2,000 Bank One Texas customers got bounce checks notices that were part of a year 2000 compliance test. But that was nothing compared to Oswego, Illinois, monthly electric bill last year. The village was billed $7 million for service that usually cost them $11,000 a month. The bill was generated by software bugs in the new Y2K compliant computer system just purchased by the Commonwealth Edison. <laughs> well, according to a global conference on Millennium Bug Preparedness, nobody will be totally prepared for the arrival of the year 2000. I don't think any country will completely meet the deadline, even in countries that are the most far along in Y2K readiness, there'll be some kind of disruption. That's what Bruce McConnell, director of the International Y2K Cooperation Center in New York, told Reuters on March 3rd. 
A U.S. Senate panel reported March 2nd that the Millennium Bug may set off civil unrest in poor countries. It said it could undermine economic growth in Asia, Latin America, and Africa, and disrupt global trade in oil and other commodities. Senator Robert Bennett described his nightmare scenario to the press in March 7th interview. I have a nightmare of CNN cameras in villages or cities where there is no power, no telecommunications, the banking system is broken down, widespread rioting. Bennett is chairman of the Senate Special Committee on Y2K. His remarks were reported by Reuters on March 3rd, 1999. The Manila Summit stressed all sectors of business and society would be affected by the millennial bug. The most critical sectors identified were water, electricity supply, health care, transportation, telecommunications, and social security. The summit concluded that cross-border damage could arise among those nations thought to be most Y2K ready. Included on the list were Australia, Canada, Yes, the United States. Mm. Well, according to Representative Stephen Horn, the government is nowhere near ready to meet Millennial Midnight, no matter what promises are coming out of Washington. Only three federal agencies have gotten straight A's for their remediation efforts. Now, those three are Social Security, the VA, and the National Science Foundation. But all the SSA and VA efforts may be in vain. The Treasury Department issues the checks. Now, they received a D minus, and they won't be ready by 010100 until sometime after 010101. But that's not the worst news. The Departments of Education, Defense, State and Transportation, which includes the Federal Aviation Administration, are all years behind. The Department of Defense owns a full one-third of the nation's computer systems. The DOD, as we call it, won't be fully year 2000 compliant until 2009. So as long as we don't need to cash any government checks, learn to read or defend against a foreign enemy for about nine years, Y2K is no big deal. You know, we're not trying to scare you folks. We're just reporting the news as it is. But you know, it isn't all bad news. The turn of the millennium may mean the end of the IRS, at least the IRS as we know it. Ha! Diggity dogs! <laughs> well, the IRS has made some progress preparing its mainframes, but its PC systems are a major problem. The IRS has assessed its 88,000 programs and retired 13,000 of them. Of the remaining 75,000, 40,000 are ready, but 35,000 remain to be repaired. The IRS's year 2000 guru, John Yost, doesn't really know what will happen if Y2K disrupts the taxman's operation. The official IRS contingency plan involves turning off the problem systems. In other words, there is no IRS contingency plan. Maybe we'll finally get that flat tax system that uh, we're all hoping for, Hal. Yeah, well, maybe so, Cliff. It's, uh, uh, it's a sad day when the IRS goes down, I'll tell you. <laughs> yes, well, Cliff, during the Gulf War, the United States proudly po pointed to the success of our smart weapon systems. You'll remember the footage of bombs being directed into windows or down chimneys during our air attacks over Baghdad. Back then, only 10% of our arsenal was in the so-called smart bomb category. Following the war, we set out to upgrade all our systems. The Pentagon developed weapons that followed the Global Positioning System, or GPS. The GPS breaks down the planet into small grid coordinates. Weapons can be guided to those coordinates using information from the GPS satellites orbiting the Earth. Both the weapons and the GPS guidance systems are operated by computer systems and embedded chips. In the event of a catastrophic Y2K failure, those weapon systems will downgrade from smart to stupid. Think of the potential. The world's great superpower blinded by the failure of NORAD's early warning system. Our awesome arsenal will be useless. All we'll have left is our conventional forces and conventional weapons. The most powerful military nations will be those who rely on World War II type military technology. One military analyst predicted that a complete Y2K failure would put the U.S. on a military par 
with countries like North Korea, Yugoslavia, or Cuba? Hmm. Well, the United States has acknowledged nuclear stockpile of just over 12,000 devices of all types. Russia admits to a stockpile of 22,000. Now, what will happen when non-compliant computers go haywire? Experts now believe the risk of an accidental firing of nuclear weapons at millennial midnight is more or less zero. Now, later in the day, however, the risk rise significantly. The worry is that Y2K-induced failures in communication systems or early warning radar might set off a nuclear exchange later. Nothing could happen at the stroke of midnight, but disaster may strike in the hours after midnight. It's not like it's an improbable scenario. Back in 1980, U.S. nuclear warning personnel saw what turned out to be a phantom Russian missile honing in on the United States. A faulty computer chip worth 50 cents set off a false alarm that could have launched nuclear Armageddon. In 1995, Moscow went to a state of high nuclear alert. A Norwegian scientific probe was launched from the Baltic Sea. Moscow's early warning radar interpreted it as an incoming missile. Boris Yeltsin had eight minutes to give the order to stand down. The order came with less than a minute to spare. Both sides continue to operate under a nuclear policy called launch on warning. That means that if one side believes an attack has commenced, it will launch a full response rather than lose the weapons on the ground. Even if the other side aborts before impact, the response will already be in the air. A report released in January 1999 by the British American Security Information Council contained this warning. If Y2K breakdowns produce inaccurate early warning data, or if communications and command channels are compromised, the combination of hair trigger force postures and Y2K failures, well, they could be disastrous. Well, Cliff, you know, that's not really the worst of it. From, from one of the highest ranking defectors from Russia, we found out that they have what they call a dead hand system. Hmm. And that is, uh, the Russian computers are set up so that if they do not check in with them for a certain period of time, it is assumed there was an attack and all were killed, and the computers launch all the weapons. Well, that's a scary scenario. That's really, really scary. Uh. Well, China is also a nuclear power and also has accurate ICBM targeting systems, courtesy of Clinton administration. China is one of the most heavily computerized of the major eastern developing economies. As of early February, 53% of China's most crucial enterprises didn't even know how to detect the problem, let alone fix it. The government of China is not much further ahead, paying little attention to the critical middle-level infrastructure. The result will be a patchwork network of compliant and non-compliant computers interacting with unpredictable results. Somewhere in that network is Beijing's nuclear launch on warning protocol. The British government announced plans to take its nuclear weapons program completely offline in advance of Millennial Midnight. It is unlikely that Moscow or Beijing and Washington would agree to do the same. Mistrust is the name of the game today. Ironically, it was the advancements in microprocessor technology that made it possible for us to pretend to trust each other. You know, Hal, at this point, I gotta say that our DOD, Department of Defense, is talking to the equivalent agency in Russia, mm -hmm. trying to work out something. Mm -hmm. I just certainly hope that they get everything worked out between now and the first of the year. I sincerely do too, Cliff. I do. Computer-aided intelligence systems made sneak attacks impossible. Now, the danger is that the intelligence network will go dark, prompting a return to the 1950s-style paranoia. The Kremlin wonders, will Beijing strike from the darkness? The Washington paranoid scan the skies. The computers report no activity. Is it true or a Y2K glitch? Fingers tighten on the nuclear buttons. On the other hand, the computers indicate an incoming attack. Is that true, or is it a Y2K glitch? Knuckles whiten in the nuclear war councils of the world. Just visualize that. Y2K could have no effect whatsoever on the global computer network, and this would still be scenario after millennial midnight. If you don't know whether your data is corrupted, how can you tell if Y2K happened or if it didn't? Mm. Wow. 
Well, the U.S. Defense Department has some one and one half million computers, 28,000 computer systems, and 10,000 computer networks. Together, this collection of computer brain power represents America's first line of defense against attack and the core of our offensive weapons capability. The Department of Defense has identified an ever-changing number of these computer systems as being mission critical. That's a kind of a catch-all term that operates on a sliding scale, depending on who's asking the questions. The DOD has admitted that 25% of these critical systems will not function properly after January 1st, 2000. Pentagon spokesman Susan Hansen tried to put the best face on the problem for public consumption, but it just didn't quite have a calming effect. None of us, she said, knows exactly what is going to happen. We feel cautiously optimistic that what will happen is some nuisances rather than crises. We feel pretty confident that we will be able to provide for the national security of the United States, end quote. Well, Hal, according to a report in Computer World, the cost of Y2K repairs will exert a downward drag on the U.S. economy. Companies on the Fortune 500 list expect to spend at least $11 billion by the end of this year. Fed Governor Edward Kelly told a Senate subcommittee that Y2K has been good for the economy short term, but only in the short term. But Kelly warned that we're largely shifting the timing of these investment expenditures. Today's added growth is likely borrowed from spending at some time in the future. Now, Kelly was asked about the likelihood of a year 2000 recession, and he warned that if disruptions are severe enough, we could run into a recession. But I don't anticipate that. Well, Kelly said that even though the Fed and the stock exchange will likely make the deadline, that is only part of the solution or the problem, depending on your point of view. Business partners and suppliers who are not compliant could threaten the system anyway. If telecom networks, utility companies, or other large banks fail during the date change, it could have a domino effect on the rest of the economy. Kelly said it would impair the Fed's ability to process the nation's checks and distribute currency. Kelly's appearance before the Senate was supposed to reassure lawmakers and the nation. But his testimony contained far too many ifs to be very reassuring, Hal. Well, Cliff, you know, I, I have found that wherever there's a question with a computer program, you can look for trouble. You Those certainly. ifs usually mean trouble. <laughs> you certainly can. Well, Cliff, there are those who see a kind of a partial disruption, but on a more or less long-term basis. This view makes the assumption that 90 to 95 percent of the defective embedded chips will be replaced and non-compliant computer code will have been rewritten in time. In this scenario, damage is limited to state and local computer systems and medium to small business networks. Thanks to the cascade effect, these failures will have serious implications, but by and large will be isolated failures rather than a global blackout. One U.S. congressman thinks Y2K is important enough to take a day off from life. Senator Harold Ford, Jr. wanted Congress to set aside June 1, 1999, as a sort of national Y2K test day. His bill would require federal agencies and federal vendors and suppliers to conduct Y2K compliance tests on that day. Since conducting those tests would mean shutting down operations, this is some major legislation. Ford argued that instead of having those in the government argue about who's ready and who's not, we ought to just test the system. That way, he said, everybody will know. There was an immediate reaction to Ford's plan, all negative. There's good reason for that opposition. To begin with, some testing can't be conducted in a single day. Recurring events like payroll, quarterly reports, and so on would have to be included in any test in order to be valid. Then, of course, there's the question of mission critical systems. Nobody knows exactly how to define mission critical, and nobody wants to just try it out now. Ford's plan had another major drawback. If approved on June 1st, everybody would know, and that could start a public panic six months earlier. Well, I'm certainly glad that one didn't pass. <laughs> Currency is not the same as money, no, although we have come to think of it that way in our society. In reality, money is a different animal altogether. 
simply stated, money is an instrument of value that can be exchanged for goods and services. It retains its value only as long as people are confident that it will continue to be accepted as an instrument of trade. For example, would you consider selling your brand new car for 2,000 American greenbacks? Of course not. But if you lived in 1920, it would be a very good deal indeed. You could take your $2,000, replace the car with a better one, and still have a four-figure bank account. In 1920, a new Ford could be had for less than $750. Now, today, a new Ford is worth 20,000 or more American greenbacks. The $19,250 difference is the result of 70 years of inflation. Granted, a modern automobile has more whistles and bells than a 1920 Model T, but relatively speaking, a car is a car, and the Model T was as good as Detroit could offer at the time. The reason that a new car costs so much more now is because people won't accept anything less to sell one to you. Currency is not money. It's an expression of trust. Once people don't trust its buying power, well, it becomes worthless. Ouch. <laughs> well, to a large degree, the amount Y2K disrupts your life will be dictated by where you live. In big cities like Los Angeles, Chicago, New York, things will be considerably different than they will be in, say, Clarksville, Texas. Los Angeles is a city in the middle of a desert with its face to the mountains and its back to the Pacific Ocean. Almost everything necessary to maintain urban life comes from somewhere else. Water is piped in from the north. It supplies the city and provides irrigation for farmers. Food is trucked in or arrives by rail. A significant Y2K disruption in the energy or transportation grid would interrupt critical supplies. The same for New York or Chicago. Hmm, well in the event of a Y2K power brownout, LA's water supply may not be affected, but the transportation grid might. Or in Chicago, there may be a, no problem with delivery, but the power grid may fail. The cascade effect means that everybody will be affected in some way or another, but to different degrees. Most Y2K experts agree that if you have a choice, the best place to be on 010100 is somewhere other than a large city, not because of what will happen, but because of what might happen. To some people, millennial midnight will seem to be little more than a tempest in a teapot. They'll wonder why they took all the precautions. In other parts of the country, Y2K could cut off supplies of food, water, and utilities for days, even weeks. Now the problem is, in a modified brownout, nobody will know which situation will be theirs until the fact. If a key link in the computer chain is severed, power, finance, telecommunications, medical devices, transportation, even for a few days, the consequences are unimaginable. As we've already seen, fixing some of the computers in time won't prevent chaos. For example, it won't do General Motors any good to fix their systems unless all their suppliers fix theirs as well. You can't build an automobile unless all the parts are there. It won't help banks to fix their computer system if satellites or phone lines go down. The world is now completely interdependent and computers connect the whole system together and make it work. Well, how the President of the United States announced with some fanfare that Social Security is now 100% Y2K ready. Nice. Notice he didn't say Y2K compliant. The Social Security Administration is further along than any other government agency, that's true. But even they can only claim Y2K readiness. There are two levels of preparedness, Y2K ready and Y2K compliant. Y2K compliant means repairs have been made and tested satisfactorily. Y2K ready means repairs have been made, but tests are still pending. So those systems might work, but nobody knows for sure. The Social Security Administration gets high marks for being the most proactive of the federal agencies. It began working on a solution to the year 2000 problem way back in the year 1989, before most of us even knew there was a problem. Consequently, the SSA scored high marks in the General Accounting Office's Year 2000 readiness test. So come what may, Social Security recipients can count on their checks being delivered without interruption across the century divide, right? <laughs> Wrong. 
wrong indeed. According to Treasury Secretary Robert Rubin, the Treasury Department is pretty in pretty good shape for Y2K compliance overall. There's only one sub-agency with truly serious compliant problems. You guessed it. The only Treasury Department agency whose ability to function past millennial midnight is in doubt is the Financial Management Service. The FMS is the agency charged not only with the actual disbursement of Social Security benefits, but also with the financial transactions of significant portions of virtually every government agency. That includes government's other star pupil, the Veterans Administration. This is another example of the hidden consequences of Y2K, even if almost all the systems are ready in time. Social Security has been working on the problem for the last decade. They're on time and ready to face the challenges of the new millennium. They can do everything on the other side of the century mark that they can do now, except actually issue the checks. And therefore, there's the problem. Yes. One of the biggest problems in assessing the dangers posed by the millennium bug is assessing what we, the public, can do to protect ourselves. Now, all this information is more or less useless by itself without some ideas and solid suggestions for surviving the coming catastrophe. Now, this report, be it, would be little more than a statement like, the sky is falling. Well, if the sky were following, like in the children's story, then there is nothing that can be done in the area of self-preservation. But now there are a number of things you can do to protect yourself against Y2K. Remember, while its overall effect can and will be catastrophic in some areas, it is temporary. As we pointed out, Y2K's most ominous feature is its unpredictability. Many experts warn that the nation's utilities may shut down on January 1st, 2000. For many parts of the country, that means the dead of winter no time to be without heat. A practical suggestion would be to make sure you have a working fireplace, a wood-burning stove, and lay in enough wood to last at least three months. Buy it early in the season, when prices will be a little lower, and the wood will have plenty of time to dry. Make sure you have an adequate supply of fresh drinking water for at least three months. Experts suggest about two gallons per day per person. Make sure you have enough canned goods and freeze-dried foods stored against the possible food shortage brought on by transportation interruptions. Well, get hard copies of all your important documents, that's for sure. Those documents like birth certificates, social security records, bank balances, mortgage papers and investments. Without computers, you may not be able to prove ownership or identification unless you have these documents. Get critical prescriptions filled. Make sure you have a well-stocked first aid kit and a first aid manual. For in the first few days at least, communications and transportation may be disrupted. Set aside some cash to use during the emergency. If you can, buy some silver or gold coins now. Don't wait till later. Don't get certificates, get the coins. Despite inflation, an ounce of gold today will buy as much as an ounce of gold would have bought way back in the 1920s. You know, Hal, there's so many other things that, that, uh, that I know I'm doing and I think everybody should do, but the things we're talking about are things that you should do anyway. You should have sure. around your home. You should have an adequate amount of flashlights. I mean, let's face it, we mm. have earthquakes here in California. Uh, there's hurricanes other places. There's sure. uh, um, the eastern seaboard. They had their own problems. And the central uh, part of the country has their tornadoes. Absolutely. And so, so, so keep adequate flashlights, right. batteries, things like mm -hmm. that. And we have talked, we just mentioned in this that Y2K could bring on a recession or, in my theory, a deflation, actually. Right. I think uh, of uh, currency. I think that uh, uh, some of this is going to happen beforehand. Mm -hmm. I really and truly feel that uh, uh, our stock market is going to have a major correction before the first of the year. Surely. Now, the Y2K, if it does not, the Y2K could certainly bring that on and we'd feel like that was a disaster too. Mm -hmm. Or it could feed the correction that I feel now has been put off by the Federal Reserve at least until the fall. Yes. And in fact, if you were to ask me, I would tell you that I think the stock market will still go well over 10,000. I mm -hmm. said that a year ago and I'll say it now. And then we'll have a major correction. But all of these things 
add up. Mm -hmm. And it's not just the Y2K. Mm -hmm. These things are happening around the world. Remember, we've said many times mm -hmm. that a trillion and a half dollars a day, now that's per day, every 24 hours, are transferred electronically around the world. Mm -hmm. What's going to happen here? Yes. Yes. So you see, there's so many other areas here that we could cover. We're just trying to get as much as we can in here uh, to tell the people, but prepare. Well, I, my feeling as I've gone through all of these facts, mm -hmm. and certainly they, they can frighten you, but uh, I just feel like if you're out there really frightened, just, just realize we pray that things won't be as bad as, as the, it appears. And, you know, we've just tried to faithfully give you the honest facts that we found, and no attempt is being made to try to put fear in you beyond what is possible. We hope and pray that many of these things will be corrected by January the 1st. But let's face it, folks, it's a lot better to be prepared. I believe God has allowed this message to come out early so that uh, we'll have a chance to prepare. You know, you look through, uh, even in the Old Testament, Joseph was given a warning to prepare for the uh, for the famines before they happened. In the book of Acts, uh, they were warned that a serious uh, famine and recession was coming, and they, they uh, went and told the churches all over uh, the Roman world, and they prepared for it. I think God is just giving us a chance to know what's coming and to give us a chance to prepare. Don't you? That certainly makes, uh, makes a lot of sense to me because uh, uh, there's a lot of things we didn't bring up in this that we could, uh, yes. the uh, developing countries, things mm. like this, but mm. God has its, his own plan. He certainly and, does. And uh, there is a light at the end of the tunnel, isn't there, Hal? Yes, there is. Well, you know, Cliff, I know that a lot of Christians think, well, we probably won't be here when real trouble breaks out. But I don't think that's doctrine. I think that's dreaming. I really believe that uh, we will be here for some significant disruption and so forth. And therefore, it is really incumbent upon us to do our very best to prepare, to lay in supplies and so forth. But there's a preparation that's much, much more important than that. For those of us who know Jesus Christ, and for those who don't, you can listen, get some wisdom from us. But for those of us who know Jesus Christ, the most important thing is to prepare spiritually. You know, God doesn't allow anything to happen without giving us His protection and His plan. That's why there are more than 7,000 promises in the Bible, and they're only useful during this life. They're not useful in the next. And so He wants us to learn those promises, at least learn 20 promises that uh, figure in on guidance and protection and provision and so forth. Because God anticipated that this was happen, this would happen. It's not surprising to Him. And in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 1, we're admonished in the light of another historical situation with Israel. When they came out of Egypt, we're admonished not to be afraid of the circumstances but to be afraid of not claiming His promises in the midst of those circumstances. And He says uh, that we are to fear lest one of these promises being left us of entering His rest, any of us should fall short of it. That means to leave it unclaimed. You see, uh, it's not something that's optional for the Christian to enter God's rest. It's something He commands us to do. And therefore, we know that He's provided a place for us. He's pro provided a place of inner peace in the face of extraterrestrial or in extra uh, turmoil. And you know what? Even though that turmoil may come, God says that there is a place where we can enter His rest. And in spite of all that's going on, we can be stabilized inside. You know, when He brought the children of Israel out of Egypt, that's His great illustration of how we're to learn to trust Him. He sent Moses to them without an army. 
He sent them, he sent Moses to them to remind them of the promises he had made to their forefather Abraham and to give them the promise that he had now come to take them to the land of milk and honey and to give it to them. So Moses went in with only promises in the midst of great powers and potential great, great problems. Without an army, without any significant physical advantage, Moses went in and he simply stated what God wanted him to say to Pharaoh. And God, in response to Moses' faith, broke the back of the mightiest nation on earth at that time. Now, without an army, Pharaoh, through the power of God, responding to the faith of the people, especially Moses, caused Pharaoh to let these people go when he didn't want to. And once they were released, they started out and they, they went uh, out and he led them, not the quick way, but he led them to a place and told them the camp where they were in a cul-de-sac. Their backs were to the Red Sea and there were hills to the north and the south of them. Now this is just not some fairy tale or some old folks tale. This is the Word of God, folks. It tells us in Exodus chapter 13 14 how that once the children of Israel got in this cul-de-sac, God caused Pharaoh to bring out all of his army, the mightiest army of the day, so that when the children of Israel looked up the one way out, they saw the mightiest army of the day closing in on them. Humanly speaking, it looked like a slaughter was about to take place. And yet, God is the God of circumstances. He knows the Y2K is coming and He knows that we're going to be in the middle of it. Think of it in terms of what happened back then. The Egyptians were charging down on them. The people were camped defenselessly. But what God wanted them to do was think, wait a minute, He told us that He would bring us in response to the promises He had made he would bring them to the promised land and give it to them. They also knew that he had led them every step of the way to be in that impossible situation. So what did he expect them to do? He expected them to not look at the circumstances, but to look up to the God who allowed those circumstances and just believe him and say, look God, you said you were going to take us safely to the promised land. Now what are all of these Egyptians doing here? We can't wait to see how you're going to deliver us from this impossible situation. And so, what did they do? Well, the majority of the people, I'm sorry to say, panicked, and that's why we got a message for today. But Moses believed God. And in response to Moses' faith, God delivered them. Moses stood with his back to the Red Sea looking at the same terror that they were looking at, but there was one difference. He saw the promises of God as more real than the very real threat that was coming at them. He stood there and God said, stand still and watch the deliverance of the Lord. For the Egyptians you see today, you will see no more again forever. Turn and divide the ocean. Raise your staff. And he did, and the Red Sea opened. The people went across on dry land. God delayed the army so that they could not catch up with them. And then once they got safely across, he caused the sea to close down upon them and destroyed the Egyptian army. Now let me tell you something, folks. That same God is our God. His promises, He tells us in Hebrews 4, but those promises are just as real, just as valid as they were then. The circumstances are different, but God is not different. He knew this problem was coming. He wants us to prepare, but He tells us in promises like Isaiah 41.10, Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. 
Yes, I will uphold you with the right hand of my righteousness. We don't know what to do. You may be afraid. Claim Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6, which says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not to your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him, and He will direct your paths. Folks, that's a promise we all need to claim right now. We need wisdom as to how to prepare. Folks, probably the most important news will be on the Y2K problem as we go through the rest of this year. You can expect to see more and more news items about this. Now, some are going to try to minimize it for their own ends, and others are going to try to exaggerate it. Now, that's why we're very grateful to TBN for allowing us to do this hour special. And we're thankful also that we're able to do the book Facing Millennial Midnight. The reason is we've tried to take the most sensible, honest approach to what's going to happen in order to keep you from being thrown off one way or the other. But I think it's going to be increasingly important for you to refer back. We're going to keep you posted on this as the rest of this year goes by. But don't get carried away by either extreme. Well, you know, I think preparedness still is the key, Hal. Yes. You, you prepare yourself for earthquakes. You prepare yes. yourself for any kind of uh, contingency thing. And I think we need to be prepared now. I wouldn't want to tell anybody not no. to prepare. It's, uh, there's not going to be a non-event. Oh, we know this. We just we don't know how deep it's going to be at this point. And certainly you don't want to wait till November 1st or thereabouts to start getting prepared. Because listen, with all that's going to be coming out on this, Everyone's going to be trying to be prepared, and there won't be much left on the I, shelves. I think the big key, and particularly our government, is they don't want people to panic. Uh, right. they're, 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 uh, the Federal Reserve doesn't want to run on the banks, right. though they have printed uh, many, many billions of dollars uh, more of currency. Yeah. Uh, our banks couldn't stand a run on them for people no. to panic and get scared, and I think that's one of the one of the big things we're all cautioning people not yeah, to do. Right. I think it's important not to go and panic in that sense. But you know, folks, I know that uh, God will give you wisdom as we know that he's going to give us all wisdom as we pray. And we're going to keep you informed on the International Intelligence Briefing, briefing on a weekly basis. I can assure you of that. God bless you. And good night, folks. Good night.